I am Dr. Ben Newman. Uh, this is Ask Dr. Ben. I'm a coronavirus researcher and I'm going to do my best to, to take you through uh, another one of these things. So this is by request. I do not seek these things out and I made myself some notes. There we go. So, all right, let's go. Okay, so the request was um, uh, some kind of commentary on uh, this thing. So this is uh, ZDog uh, MD. Yeah, he's uh, Dr. Zubin Damania, um, and he at least has been a practicing physician. I don't believe he's been practicing the last four years or so. I think he's just been uh, uh, kind of a YouTube celebrity, but he was originally trained uh, in internal medicine. medicine. There we go. Uh, all right. Um, and uh, it is him in conversation with uh, Dr. Monica Gandhi, who is an MD and a uh, master of public health. And full disclosure, I've been on a panel with Dr. Gandhi, and uh, in general, I like what she says, and I like how she thinks. Um, I don't like everything, but I like most of it, and I feel like uh, intelligent people can disagree on certain things. Um, so, all right. So this is the two of them talking. Now, I would say as a starter, all right, whenever you're dealing with z Dog, so he has got a lot of backlash from people um, who are anti-vaccine. And yeah, I don't like that for him. I don't like that for anybody. But there are also elements of what he gets across. Um, and I don't even know if, well, no, I suspect it is conscious. They come across as anti-vaccine. So he's very uh, against or hesitant or nervous about or something. He doesn't like uh, the idea of vaccines in kids. He doesn't like the idea of really any protection at all in kids um, from COVID-19. And the two of us differ uh, big time on that, <laughs> which, yeah, um, yeah. All right. So um, let's go. And so I'll go through point by point. And so the points are actually uh, up here you know, in this little uh, uh, thing where he's going to take you through and show you, um, yeah, uh, all the different parts of the video. So I've got them listed out down here. Let's go. All right. Um, number one, right at the beginning, he, uh, I think in the intro, or maybe, I think it's actually in this part, uh, um, uh, where he says, were we wrong to say the vax that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 outbreak was over? I would say that I don't think anybody who was acting <laughs> responsibly ever said it was over uh, during the summer. I know there were a lot of people that wished it was over, and there were people like me saying, if you take off your masks and if we don't vaccinate, and if we all just go back to doing blah, whatever, with non-herd immunity, things are going to get bad again. And <laughs> here we are. Yeah. <laughs> don't always like to be, uh, was it Cassandra? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the prophet who is uh, heard but never listened to. But yeah, uh, you know, the writing was definitely on the wall for this one. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah. But that's not really like a fact check sort of thing. That's just a... Uh, Hey, you know, try not to mess up in the first place and then you don't have to walk it back afterward and definitely don't blame somebody else because, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, second one um, uh, right there in the introduction. And he's just made another video about this that I will not comment on. Uh, but he says that uh, vaccine mandates are a bad idea. Again, this is a point on which I would very much disagree uh, for two reasons. Uh, vaccine mandates have worked before in the U.S. against other diseases. And uh, yeah, it's the only way to really make sure that people get vaccines. In different times, people were more receptive to the idea of vaccines. It's just the world we live in right now. You get all this crazy stuff in a large part, I think, stoked by Internet skeptics. And because of that, you've got a lot of people that just say, well, I don't know what to believe. And He's actually one of the ones that yeah, puts out this message that, well, people don't know what to believe. And he doesn't necessarily tell them what to believe, but he does amplify that particular message of disconnect. And I, I don't know. At that point, are you helping or are you just uh, are you getting more clicks? I'm not sure. Um, so, um, yeah, I, again, when you're talking about Z Dog MD, he's never completely wrong but he's usually not a whole lot more than halfway right <laughs> yeah, when we're talking about coronavirus. Um, um, yeah, so there we go. Uh, let's keep going. So, um, oh yeah, the other part of that was that uh, 
no country has actually made it all the way to the herd immunity threshold through purely voluntary vaccination. And that kind of shows that we need a little extra oomph to get there. And the extra oomph, you know, the only way to do that that I can think of is vaccine mandates. So they haven't been tried. The U.S. is planning to try one now. I'm in favor of it. Yeah, there we go. On board. Just because this is a way to get more vaccines in arms and to actually get this uh, pandemic to end. Um, as the title said, uh, the immunity is uh, the only way through a pandemic. And uh, yeah, vaccine derived immunity is really the only way through a pandemic. So there we go. All right. Um, the next bit he's talking about here is um, messaging problems right there. And this comes up several times. And I kind of got to agree on this point. There have been some problems with messaging. And this is one of Dr. Gandhi's points that in public health, which is trying to communicate health information to the public in a way that keeps people safe, whether they want to be safe or not, and in a way that allows the country to function by getting rid of whatever disease is holding back the country. The messaging is key, and I, I guess I would have to amplify that point. That's, that's a darn good point. Um, so I see some of the messaging problems. In part, I think some of the messaging problems come from regular people and internet celebrities thinking like regular people and internet celebrities and maybe even doctors. Um, in science, when our understanding of the facts change, when new data emerges, your perspective has to change and that may mean that guidance has to change. Uh, and so there would be a direct one, two, three logical progression here. And so at least for some of this stuff, as the understanding has changed, yeah, the guidance needed to be updated in real time. And so it would look like you're saying one thing and then you say a different thing, but it's because now we know a different thing. And when you know, yeah, you got to say it. Yeah, you don't want the CDC to hold back new information and say, no, we won't tell anybody. That is not their function. That is not ever the function of public health. Um, so, yeah, I see him, but uh, I, I think the problem is bigger. And uh, yeah, sometimes we may end up being part of the problem without intending to be. All right, my paper's falling down, so let's look at it on here. All right, um, next point, and this is a Dr. Gandhi point, uh, is that uh, the messaging around the Provincetown breakthroughs. So this is the um, uh, some sort of festival, and a lot of people who were vaccinated went there. And some of them did get the virus and one or two of them had roughly the same amount of virus as some of the people who didn't get the vaccine. And so everybody leapt to conclusions and then subsequent studies that came out after this kind of filled in all the extra information. And I've got to say, Dr. Gandhi is, again, pretty much right on there. Um, well, that's uh, her point. We're not giving Z-Dog all the credit for bringing her on, but he did pick a very good guest to bring on. Yeah, so that's fine. All right, um, point number five. And this is the only point where I really differ materially. Actually, no, it's one of two points where I differ really materially with Dr. Gandhi. Um, this is on uh, what I would call the dead virus conjecture. So there's this idea that people who have had an infection continue to test positive sometimes when they feel okay. Let me say this real clearly. How you feel has no bearing on this or anything. Yeah, put your feelings in a little box, bury the box in a hole in the ground, stamp on the dirt over the hole so that nobody can see where it is, and don't worry about it because in science, feelings do not matter. There we go. In the real world, yeah, heck yeah, feelings matter a lot. That's how people operate and that's how we do everything, but it's not, it's not a science thing, yeah. So, a lot of people say, well, I feel better, so therefore the virus must be gone, so why am I still testing positive? It's a hoax. <laughs> Your test is too sensitive. The test is not too sensitive, um, etc. cetera. Um, Dr. Gandhi and very much z Dog. he's always been on this train, and uh, she apparently is also on it. They are saying that, well, she actually only says that you can't tell if the RNA in the nose is actually infectious, and it's hard to recover live virus from uh, the nose at times when there are low amounts of PCR product. One point here, it's hard to recover virus in general. So if you try this in cell culture, 
with the virus on its very favorite food, these cancer cells, you will find that somewhere between one in a hundred and about one in a thousand copies of the virus, intact floating copies with a genome inside that you can read out by PCR, about one out of a thousand will actually be capable of starting an infection. Part of that may be that we need to do better with cell culture. There may be something that we're just not giving the virus. Part of it may be that the virus is sloppy and it's put in mutations in some of those other copies and so they weren't going to boot up and so you won't find them. Part of it may be that the virus is uh, bad at assembling itself and uh, you just end up with virus particles that aren't very good. But it's always hard to isolate virus. It's just how viruses are. So you start out at a thousand to one disadvantage and then you have a virus that you don't know how old it is. You don't know when it actually came out of a cell because these viruses lose infectivity pretty fast at body temperature and high humidity, which is what you find in the nose or in the saliva. Yeah. So virus that you find inside of a person, not particularly likely to be infectious. Virus that is coughed out right away and goes into somebody else, that's the one that's going to infect. And that is one that is tough to measure. That's not what you're picking up necessarily with PCR. So I would say maybe you don't know, but you can't assume that that is dead virus. Yeah. Also, there are two papers um, that are worth talking about. Actually, no, let's narrow it down to one. One paper. Um, uh, it's by a person called Relova. It's in uh, 2018 Journal of Veterinary Sciences. And this actually looks at what is the half-life of an RNA virus. And the one they use is influenza. I looked through the data. I could not find an instance of somebody actually testing out what is the half-life of coronavirus RNA in a virion uh, at body temperature and humidity. And yeah, it's weird that hasn't been done or maybe just that I didn't find it because it was maybe a little superficial search. And so that may be a gap in my own knowledge, but I, I can't see that one. I see a lot of studies where they look at survival of the virus on at room temperature or at 40 degrees or at minus 20 or minus 80 degrees. And I see a lot where they look at how long is infectivity retained I don't see many where they look at how long is um, are you able to PCR from that virus? Yeah, what's the decay rate? So, um, but this is a paper that did it for influenza, and so for our purposes here today, we're going to pretend that influenza is coronavirus. It's the only time you're going to see me do it. Yeah, and it bugs me when we do this any other time. Um, but what they found is that the half life is it looks as though it's somewhere around a day. They had a point uh, at zero days, which was way up here. They had a point at four days, which is way down here. And if you draw the diagonal line between there, uh, the half-life would be somewhere at or less than uh, 24 hours. By four days, it was down something like three or four logs. So that is, you know, a tiny fraction. And um, by seven days, it was completely gone. They could no longer detect it after a week. We don't know whether it was undetectable after five or six days because they only did uh, sample points at uh, you know zero, four, and seven. So there you go. Uh, uh, Monday, Thursday, and I guess Monday again. <laughs> no, Monday, Friday, and Monday again. Yeah, ah, days. I don't know. Hard. Okay. Next thing. We're on the back now. On the back nine. Um, yeah. Uh, boosters. Uh, so uh, Z-Dog's conjecture is that they are not needed. And this is very much a him point rather than a Dr. Gandhi point. Who said you had to stop at two doses of a vaccine? So a lot of the vaccines that we take as children and as adults, you take more than one dose. Polio, four doses. There's some vaccines where you're recommended to get boosters every 10 years or so. Uh, I think the tetanus one works like that. Um, and so you've got a bunch of different vaccines. They need different amounts. Two vaccines was the minimum dose that got approved by the FDA as working well enough that we can say this works well enough. That's all it is. We don't yet know how many doses it takes to build what would be lifelong immunity. But um, yeah, it may be uh, um, somewhere around three, maybe four, maybe five. I don't know. We're going to find out. And then that's going to be the actual number that we go forward with. And so don't get all bent out of shape, Mr. Dog. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. Don't worry that it's called a booster. It's really an incomplete series of vaccines, and we're getting them, 
and we're figuring out how many we need in real time. Yeah, because I would rather figure it out in real time than wait for five years, prove exactly how many we need, and then go out and start vaccinating, because a lot of people would die before then, and I don't want to see that happen. All right, um, next point is a Dr. Gandhi point, and I gotta agree. She says if we give boosters third shots in the USA, that's going to mean fewer third shots for places like Sub-Saharan Africa. She's right. The doctor is right. Yeah. And that is like a fairness issue. And I don't know where to come down on that. Uh, um, yeah. Part of me that's sitting here in America wants to see America clear out the virus and then widen that out. Like the way you'd put out a forest fire. You contain it and then you sort of push back in and finally get rid of the last embers. But there's a basic fairness issue here, too. So I don't know. I don't know. I could see it going either way. Um, so that's fine. Um, point eight. Uh, this is another Z dog point. And oh my gosh, yeah, we're uh, he agrees with her on a lot of her points. We'll give him that. So it's not all bad. Um, but he says basically that Australia should have let the virus in and should have built natural immunity. So uh, right there, point eight and point nine. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say no because this. All right. First of all. Stop saying natural immunity when you mean a person who got infected and then got over it and miraculously didn't die. Yeah, <laughs> that is the worst way to build immunity just in because the side effects are damage to heart, damage to brain, damage to lungs, and then you also might die. And you're also going to pass it on to your loved ones. Yeah, don't, don't get it. There's nothing natural about getting hit by a truck. There's nothing natural about getting run over by a virus. Yeah, don't do it. Don't do it, kids. Yeah. Um, all right, so natural, dumb. I don't like that word. I don't like that word. And I think when you see anybody use that word, one, it's a word that's been in circulation for a while, so I guess you can't tell. But when I see somebody using that word, my ears perk up a little bit, and I think, oh, this person may be selling something, and that thing may be a... Uh, go get COVID, don't get vaccinated kind of anti-vax strategy. So that's not really what we're going with here. Um, uh, and I don't know that either of these uh, commentators believes that. So don't, yeah, don't read that into this. Just if you hear it elsewhere in the world, pay attention. Yeah, and pay attention to what the rest of the person is saying and then try and decide where it is that they come down on this. Um, fine, um, let's see. Um, and yeah, no, Australia should not let the virus in and let the virus run rampant to build immunity because a lot of people die when you do that. Yeah. And Australia, well, they have a native vaccine program. It's in the process still. Uh, it's one of the slower ones. It's actually kind of on par with um, like the Novavax and it's a similar strategy. And eventually that may get there and may help. Um, it's just that, uh, yeah, they do not have a ton of access right now. And so I think they're more limited at the access side um, than the wanting to side. Now, there may be other political things also going on there. I don't know about those. I'm not close enough to the situation. But uh, yeah, no. Opening your door and letting COVID in is never the right answer. Yeah, I think we ought to know that by now. Okay. Point nine, where I differ, differ, disagree with both of them. Actually, no, point ten, sorry. Um, is that we uh, won't or can't eradicate uh, SARS and it's endemic now. If you mean endemic in that it's worldwide and there's a lot of it around, I guess I agree. Those are facts. If you mean endemic in that we have to learn to live with this forever, I don't think you're right. And frankly, anybody who says it's endemic, what I would say to you is you don't get to make the rules about the future. <laughs> you, you don't get to decide what happens in the future all you get to decide is when you quit. And it sounds like these two may acquit, at least on that front. And so, I don't know, maybe this is a moment of weakness and maybe they can be brought back onto Team Human and Team Let's Find a Better Future rather than giving up because I am not about giving up. Yeah, yeah. You cannot surrender to a virus no matter how hard you try. Okay, um, let's see. Um, a Dr. Gandhi point. Masks are great, but they are not better than the vaccine. I think that's fair. I think that is fair, and that's a good messaging point. Get the vaccine. Get vaccinated. Yeah. 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 It works better. Yeah. Because it's protection from the inside. You can wear a mask on top of the vaccine. That's fine. 
but you want the vaccine in there don't just rely on a mask because everybody eats and everybody itches their nose and uh there's just gonna be times when stuff can come in yeah you will let your guard down uh with the mask and the vaccine is there for you man it's there on the inside we're gonna keep you strong okay um let's see uh point number i think 12 uh, i don't know yeah no uh, yes maybe um okay so da -da 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 -da. ah okay the idea that vaccine mandates need to account for previous immunity from infection see this one i think is tough because that is hard to document easy to fake and i think the people that were anti-vaccine all along are just going to say i was totally infected because a lot of people don't know whether they were infected they were sick in november december september 2019 and they say well it could have been and probably not but unless you're you were in wuhan china probably not <laughs> But yeah, that's a thing. And so a lot of people don't know whether they were infected. And prior infection is no guarantee of future immunity. We have seen that in several papers now. It, antibodies can drop, particularly antibodies drop hard in people who are over 60. So yeah, don't make assumptions. Uh, don't write checks your body is not prepared to cash, basically. All right, fine. Uh, next thing is... Da, 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 da. Okay, the idea that we should vaccinate adults to keep kids safe. That may be half the equation, but why not vaccinate everybody to keep everybody safe? Because not every adult can make a sustained immune response to this virus. Uh, it drops off the older you get. Um, and so that, that's the flaw in that one. Uh, the particularly elderly don't always make good responses um, uh, to the vaccine or to the virus. And so, no, it's no guarantee. Don't, yeah, don't make dumb assumptions and you won't fall into dumb traps. There we go. <laughs> and the last one, number 14, uh, they both conclude that um, uh, ivermectin is not good. Um, but uh, Dr. Gandhi says uh, we should not shame people uh, by calling it horse paste and stuff like that, which I think is humorous, but... Also, all right, shame may not work as a uh, messaging tool. Okay, fine. Yeah, I'll give that. But um, ivermectin is a thing called an ion channel inhibitor. So there are little uh, holes in the membrane that let ions go in and out. And ivermectin actually nails three of these shut in parasites. And the reason why it was originally approved is that it doesn't really do much to the human ion channels. It beats up parasite ion channels from particular parasites doesn't really uh, affect human ion channels. And so we're using this thing against COVID. And the thing is, COVID doesn't have ion channels that are required. Um, there's a protein called E that will let some ions in and out, but you can block it or you can take away its ability to let ions in and out. And this has no effect whatsoever on the virus's ability to infect. So the ion channel activity is not essential and the virus doesn't have another ion channel. It doesn't have any that look like the ion channels that are being inhibited by ivermectin. So there's no good way that ivermectin is going to directly inhibit the growth of the virus. And the studies are still ongoing, so we will see eventually what comes out, but you're trying to inhibit something that's not there. And the idea that the secondary effect, the effect on the cell blocking cellular ion channels and perhaps interfering with a protein in the nucleus the idea that this is going to affect the virus i mean coronaviruses don't go into the nucleus and coronaviruses don't have ion channels and ivermectin doesn't hit human ion channels very so there's I, I don't know yeah i'm pretty skeptical as to whether ivermectin is going to pan out and uh both of these people do say that there are absolute ivermectin diehards and i've heard from a couple of them and that there are people that just believe this as an article of faith. And um, yeah, I, I would say it's probably a placebo. And uh, there's no evidence that it's anything other than a placebo at the moment. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Is this another grading the experts? I don't know. I'm not going to calculate a grade here. But um, um, uh, yeah, shout out to Dr. Gandhi and uh, what she's doing. And Z Dog. I don't know. He's raising awareness of some things. But at times I wonder if he does more harm than good. But uh, yeah, there he is.
There he is. He's always he's always around, always on the internet. So there you go. Thank you very much. This has been a extra long uh, Ask Dr. Ben, and um, I'll do some shorter ones next. Uh, thanks very much.